If you're glad to be here, get out from where you're at, shake a hand or two, tell us great to have them here. Visitors, stay where you're at, we'll find you.
this morning. We can lift our hands to a lot of things. God, we get distracted by a lot in this world. We get caught up in what really doesn't matter. That when we do, we lose, we lose our sight. We lose sight on the one who can really take us through the heartache and pain. We lose sight on the one that can really heal the brokenness of our lives. So many times in life we try to fix it. We try to solve it in our own way. But God, ultimately, only you and the power of your presence can heal us. Only you and the, your presence can restore lives. Only you, God, can look down into the, the darkest of places. Only you, God, can see the sickness and make it well. Only you, only you, God. And when we worship you, we put you center of our life, then real change can happen. Then life change can happen. pray right now in this moment in this time come and fill this place with your presence come and touch hearts like no other if you're here today and just at a place of loss maybe maybe you're at a place where you really don't know where to turn you feel the pain of life. You feel the hurt from the journey. You're here this morning. You say, you know what? I just need to worship God and put him center on my life. I need to just surrender everything I am, everything I ever hoped to be. And just, just make him bigger. God is here for you today. God sees the struggles of your heart and life. God knows the thoughts and intentions. And he loves you. He cares for you. He's here. So as we sing this again, would you lift your hands all across this place? Let's sing this. I'm gonna lift my hands till I can reach heaven. I'm gonna shout in your name till the walls come falling down. I've come to worship. I've come to worship. Thank you. 
experience the glory of your God. Lift your hands and make it your prayer. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware. our prayer today, that we'd be led by the Holy Spirit, that God, you would guide and direct every parts of our lives, that we welcome your Holy Spirit into our marriage, into our homes, into our kids' lives, that we welcome your Spirit into our schools and into our workplaces, that we welcome your Spirit, God, into everywhere we go, so that, Lord, we may be filled with you, that, God, we will walk with you, and we would speak of you, and, God, we would be transformed because of your presence. So God, I pray today as your word comes forth, may it challenge, may it change, may it fill us, God, with your presence. Thank you for being with us. Bless the remainder of this time as we hear your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I'm saying is why don't you help me out a little bit you know fudge some numbers throw some my way you know I don't work for you yeah yo I don't work for you mr. death I know you're neutral and all that stuff I'm just saying look if, if you help me out a little bit uh, I can make it worth your while if you know what I mean what's this just a little token of our friendship a gift card it's not just a gift card it's like four lattes or like or like three. I had one of them. So you've got like three small sized lattes for you. Wait, what? Is he just gonna leave? Are we cool? So are we cool or what? We're in the series of So You're Dead, Now What? We talked about death last week, and today I'm going to talk with you about a little more challenging subject. Before we do, uh, there's a story of an 80-year-old man who was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and he was going to pass from this life, and he had lots of money. And he said, you know, I don't really want to leave my money behind. I want to take it with me when I go. So he came up with a plan. 
He called himself, he called himself his priest, his lawyer, and his doctor. He said, now listen, guys, when I pass away, because I trust you, I'm going to give you $50,000 cash each. And when I die, I want you to put the money in my coffin to be buried with me. So they take the $50,000 and the, the old man passes away. And at the funeral that day, they're, they're kind of standing back and they're talking. And the priest finally just couldn't take it anymore. He said, guys, 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 I, I, I just have to be honest with you. I got to come clean. I spent 10000 of the 50000 on church repairs. So I did not put the full amount in. I put 40000 cash in, but I didn't put the, I, I used the other 10. I figured he wouldn't mind. He was a good parishioner of the church, so he wouldn't mind. So I went ahead and took liberty with that. And they were like, oh, okay. And the doctor was like, well, I have to admit something to you too. I had some, I had some personal bills, medical bills that I couldn't get taken care of. And so I used 25000 I put the 25000 extra 25000 into the casket. Um, so I, I feel bad about that. And the lawyer was just appalled. The lawyer's like, what are you talking about? You took 10000 You took 25000 Where's your oath? Where's the conviction? Come on, guys. I'm a lawyer. I should be the one doing this. But you know what? I put a check in there for the full amount. Some of you get that around lunchtime. <laughs> so we're learning about, so you're dead now what, over the next couple of weeks, this is our second week, like next week will be our last week, and uh, uh, what we're talking about is death. And, and I said this last week, I said, what you believe about death will determine how you live your life. And I said, what we know about death is death is certain, that when we die, the soul and body separates. And I learned, we learned the last thing is that the Bible says that it is appointed once to man to die and then face judgment. So death is certain, the soul and body separate, and when you die, you will face judgment of some sort. Now, for those of us who are Christ followers, our judgment will be towards enter into heaven and the crowns that we will acquire. For those that do not know Jesus Christ, their judgment will be way swifter and a lot more painful. And so today and next week, we're going to talk about the options after death, the options after judgment. Judgment takes place, and then we're going to go to places where we're going to spend eternity. We're either going to go to a place called this incredible, joyous place called heaven, where uh, God has prepared a beautiful place of, of streets of gold and, and, and mansions and, and just a place of peace and tranquility in the presence of God, and, and what a incredible place to be, or we're going to go to the other place. Now, the other place is not as much fun to talk about. That's why I'm going to talk about that today. You are so lucky you picked today to be here. Really easy to talk about the other place of heaven, and we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about heaven. It's going to be incredible to be able to share with you guys some of the glimpses of heaven and what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be a wonderful Sunday, but you cannot have heaven and if there is no hell. In order for there to be a heaven, there has to be a hell. Now, uh, surprisingly, by statistics, 75, roughly 75% 75 of people believe there's a heaven, but only 40% of people, the same people, believe there's a hell. Isn't it interesting how, how 75% can believe there's a heaven, but only 40% believe there's hell? There's a 35% there's a swing and whether or not people believe there's hell, why is it? Because hell is no fun to talk about. Let's just get real. We don't really want to talk about hell. It brings up yucky feelings. It makes us feel bad. It makes us scared. It makes us, you know, worry about, well, will I spend the eternity there? And, and so we don't like talking about hell. But the reality is when judgment happens, you're going to go to one of two places. There's no in-between. There's no, uh, there's no do not pass, go, collect $200. You will go to heaven or hell depending on where you're at in your walk with Christ. So whenever I think about preaching a message about hell, I want to skip past it. I don't want to really talk about an uncomfortable thing, but yet it's in the reality, the truth of what hell is, that we can find the true grace of God. I believe the devil's greatest plan in life is to convince people 
that hell is not real or that hell is not as bad as what you think. I believe the greatest lie that has been spoken down through the, down through the generations and the decades has been the devil to say there's no such thing as hell and people believe it. Or to say to believers, hell is real, but it's not as bad as you think. And so in my message today, in my thought process, I, I wanted to come up with kind of a, a thought that I could give to you and just kind of help you see a bigger picture. I, I hope and pray that by the time this message is over, that uh, you are not scared of hell, that in fact you're joyful that God created such a place, but by the grace of God and by the power of Jesus Christ's salvation, we don't have to fear hell because Christ overcame death, hell, and the grave. Amen? That's my hope and prayer today for you. So I want to talk today about why does hell exist, what does hell look like, and the reality of what, we, what those that go there may experience. Let's pray. Father God, help me today to communicate your word of truth. Help me, God, to be able to share from your word what, what I see as truth. And, and God, most importantly, I just pray, help me to share the grace and the love of God, even on a tough subject to talk about such as this. God, I pray, open our hearts, let us hear your truth, and let us be changed by it in Jesus' name. Amen. First question that I come to when I think about hell is this. Why would a loving God create such a place? Why would a God who loves his creation create such a place and send them to it? I think about that just like every single one of you have thought about it. I'm sure you've thought about, well, if hell is such a bad place, why did God create hell? Why does hell exist? Two thoughts I want to give you of why hell exists. The first one is this. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan. Hell exists to, for God to deal righteously with our spiritual enemy known as Satan. The world has tried to convince us that hell is going to be a place of parties. That's going to be a place where everybody's going to have their, their, uh, their cans of beer and they're, they're going to be partying around saying, this is the life. We made it. You know, it, it, the world has tried to convince us that, that Satan is in hell right now. And Satan is sitting there ruling hell and he's the DJ up in the booth. Wicka, 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 party people. Right? The world tries to make us believe that, that hell is a place where Satan rules and he reigns and he's the party, he's the, he's the Mac Daddy down there. But can I just tell you, can I just kind of, you know, spread, share some insight? Satan has never seen hell. If you read the Bible, you go to Revelation, you will see in Revelation, it says that Satan will be destroyed with all his angels in the last and final time he'll be thrown into the lake of fire till then he hasn't been there i know we see you know we think of satan with you know the the horns and you know he's all red why red i don't know he's all red you know he got a pitchfork and he's like yeah welcome come on in we have a place for everybody country music lovers to the right Cat lovers to the left. <laughs> that was such a delayed laugh for country music lovers. Did you, that was like I waited for us 30 seconds for you guys to get that. Yeah, we, we had this idea that this is what Satan's doing down there, and he's, he's, he's partying, having a great time, but Satan has never seen hell because hell is a place where God will righteously deal with our spiritual enemy, Satan, in the last days. A place created for Satan and his angels. Don't believe me? Here's what Matthew says. Matthew 25, verse 41, it says, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for by who? Prepared for the devil and who? His angels. Whenever a rebellion happened in heaven, Satan was cast out along with a third of heaven, and they are the dominion, the demons who now rule and reign together as one. But one of these days, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire to be judged for their wrongdoings. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan. Another reason why hell exists is this. Hell exists 
for God to deal righteously with unbelievers, non-believers. First Thessalonians, I uh, say, Second Thessalonians says it's this way. Second Thessalonians one eight says, "He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power." Now understand this. Hell is has been exists to deal with Satan and his angels. It was never intended to deal with God's creation. But it's why Jesus had to come and die upon the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not but have everlasting life. The love of God, the love of God for his creation was so great that he sends his son, he sends the exit strategy, he sends the safety net, he sends the recovery plan through Jesus Christ. Those who believe never have to fear hell. But there are going to be those that are confronted with the reality that we are sinners in need of a savior and they will say, I don't want him. I don't believe in Jesus. And this, this place exists for those who reject Christ as their Lord and Savior to spend eternity. I am the way, truth, and life. He who comes to me comes to the Father. There's only one way to heaven. It is through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I could keep going on and on, but the fact is, people who reject Christ, not Christ followers who are struggling to walk their faith with Christ. Hear the difference. We all, we all struggle walking with Christ. That's the grace of God. That's the love of God to help us through the struggles of our life. But for those who have blatantly rejected God and rejected Jesus Christ and said, I don't want anything to do with you, This is a place that God will deal with them righteously. Aren't you all excited and happy that you came today? I mean, I'm doing my best to make this a happy message. (laughs) Hell exists for these reasons. What will hell be like? What will hell be like? Well, we don't have an exact thing, but I will tell you this. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did any other subject. You know why he spoke more about hell? Because he cared more for the people than any other thing in this planet. He loved, he gave, he saw, he overcame. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 16, and we're going to get a glimpse through a story that is told, a parable of of what heaven and hell might be like, okay? Again, this is not specifically accurate as far as places and times, but this just gives an insight into the Jewish understanding of what hell was going to be like. So Luke chapter 16, verse 19 says this, read along when he says, there was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linens and lived in luxury every day. We're going to pause right there. Here is a rich man, a rich man. Now I'm not talking just Donald Trump rich. I'm not talking just, you know, a CEO rich. I'm not talking um, uh, lifestyles of rich and famous rich or cribs rich. I'm talking this guy in the Greek was mega rich. I mean, there's rich and there is mega rich. And he was mega rich. In fact, he was so rich, dressed in purple clothing, something that was only reserved for royalty of the day because in order to get the purple color and fabric, it was a very expensive process to do. And, and uh, his clothing uh, is stated that probably one piece of his outfit was worth more and would feed a person for an entire year. God was very, very rich. He was so rich, in fact, he ate lots of choice foods and he enjoyed luxury of eating day and night. I mean, just think about, you know, special holiday. Where do you like to go? What's one of the restaurants that you like to go to that is cashy, but you do it maybe on special holidays like, you know, maybe, um, maybe your, your anniversary or maybe a birthday or maybe a, a special retirement party or something like that. You do it for that because it's special. Well, this guy, he lived in that every day. 
He would eat that place that you think is just, I can only get once a year or once every two years. He would do that every single day. Very, very wealthy, wealthy, rich man. Rich Jewish man. A rich Jewish man who believed in a place called hell in his time. Let's go on and read what it says. It says in verse, nine, in verse 20, it says, At his gate laid a beggar, so he had a mansion. He had a, he had a gate covered around it. It says, named Lazarus. He was covered with sores. It says, And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Notice, no cats <laughs> are helping this man out. Dogs. Note. <laughs> Listen, if you like cats, please don't get offended. I just don't like them, okay? But you love them all you want. You know what? You love them all you want. You'll take that up with Jesus one day. It's okay. I think that the challenge that we run into here is we have a rich man who, who had all this incredible wealth, and, and he was very wealthy, and he dressed in all these great clothes, and you have someone who had nothing, who, who barely made it by. He was actually longing to eat what the dogs ate. This guy was very, very poor, very, very rich, very, very poor, both Jewish people, both people who believed in hell, both people who believed in a place called paradise. They both followed by Jewish tradition. And so we have people who are of the same faith, the same belief system. But we're going to see in the story that some things are going to change. See, this, this whole, uh, the, 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 what fell from the rich man's table in those days, um, they didn't have silverware, they didn't have utensils, and so they would eat with their food, they would eat with their hands. They would eat their, with their hands, and they would have stuff all over their hands from eating. And the rich people, they didn't use claws to clean up. They would take a piece of bread, and they would use it to sop up and clean up their hands. And then they would throw the bread down to the side of the table, the servants would come along and sweep up the scraps, and the servants would take it out, and they would dump it out in the streets, and when they dump it out in the streets, the beggars and the dogs would come and eat from the scraps of the rich people. It says this, goes on to say, a time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, and the rich man also died and was buried. It says, in hell... This is a rich man in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He, he, so he called to him, calls, calls to Abraham. And he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me and, and send Lazarus to, to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I am agony in this fire. So let me just paint the picture for you in the way that Jewish tradition believed Heaven and hell was, or paradise, Abraham's bosom, or Hades and hell was, is that there was a hell, and there was a chasm in between, and there was paradise. The people in hell could look over into paradise and see all the beauty and see all the, the plentifulness, and all their days live in torment that they will never experience that. So here's the, the beggar is in hell, and he's looking up, and he's thirsty. He's quenching for thirst, and he says, he says Father Abraham, just let Lazarus get just a, a tip of water on his fingers. It's, it's like this. It's, it's just a tip, just a drop, just ever so little so that I can be quenched. A millisecond of relief from the torment and agony that hell holds. Just a little bit. He calls out to him, please, please, give me just a second of relief from this agony I'm in. Hell is going to be a place of unspeakable suffering. I don't believe, I believe, I believe, I, I, I believe in contrast. Hell is going to be a place of unspeakable suffering. Heaven is going to be a place of unspeakable beauty. Words cannot grasp or define the reality of those two statements. The Bible says, you know, just to give you a glimpse of next week when you come back. The Bible says that heaven is a place that you can't even articulate with words 
how incredibly awe-struck you're going to be. Hell is a place where I cannot even tell you is a place of unspeakable suffering for the eternal part of people's lives. Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, those who worship the beast, talking about the last days, those who worship the beast, those who worship the enemy, those who take the mark of the beast, according to Revelations, according to the last days, says those who worship the beast, those who take the mark, those who have uh, surrendered to God, to the enemy, Satan, it says this, will drink the wine of God's fury and have been poured out in strength into the cup of wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. The Bible says that if we do not surrender our life to Christ, the alternative is we will surrender our life to Satan. And as a result, eternal suffering is our fate. Call it what you want, fiery furnace, weeping and gnashing of teeth, the scripture has talked about. Talked about a place where the, the fire is never quenched. Talks about a place where, where the presence of God is completely void. No love, no mercy, no grace in that place. Take the worst pain you've ever experienced in your life and live it every second of every day. For the eternity. I don't know about you. I've never been burned. Except for, I don't know, I was probably about, I was about 13, 14 years old. And we had a car wash at uh, our church. And uh, you can probably tell that I'm not the tannest of person. So I thought I'd get a tan that day. And uh, so I took off my shoes and I did an eight-hour car wash with no shoes on, with the water magnifying the heat as it bounded down. I went home with third degree sunburn, boils, oozing, purple feet. They were purple people. Hot as could be, I was so miserable. I had to go to school with no shoes on. I could pull it off because I'm so cool. I, uh, it's the only pain I can really relate to. And I got to tell you, I can't imagine living in that every single second of every single day for the rest of my life. It's the worst physical pain you can imagine every day. That is what hell will be. So Jesus comes along and Jesus teaches about hell and Jesus does something even better. He gives them an illustration. He shows them a physical place. They will be like this place. It's called, it's, it's in Jerusalem. In fact, Michelle and I had a chance to visit Jerusalem this past March, and we had a chance to see this place that Jesus would have talked about in his time. It's called the Valley of Hinnom, and it's also known as Gehenna. Gehenna. Everybody say Gehenna. God bless you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Gehenna is a place where um, in the days before Jesus and during the times of Jesus, that they would take and they would go to this valley. It's a valley to the left of Jerusalem, a valley that they would take people to. Uh, and the people that went there would go and worship the fire god called Moloch. And Moloch demanded that fires burn 24-7 every single day of the year. Malik required, the god, fire god Malik required that firstborns be sacrificed every single day. Malik required that the fire would never go out. If it does, he would destroy anyone that's, re that's connected to worship of Malik. So in the time of Jesus, there was a real place known as Gehenna where they worshiped the fire god Malik and they sacrificed every day. Not only did they do that, but that the city would take their trash and they would use that as a fire barrel, you know, to go and throw everything in and burn all up. They would take prisoners that were executed. And once they were killed, they would throw their bodies out in the fire as well. So you can imagine this place of fire never going out and the stench that would come from that place. This is the illustration that Jesus wanted us to see. This place, and yet Jesus says, this place here is nothing compared 
to the place that exists for Satan and his angels. Rich man in hell, a beggar in heaven, it has nothing to do with rich or poor. It has nothing to do with social class. Sometimes we think, well, the poor people are going to go to heaven and the rich people, well, we don't know. We don't know because rich is really relative. I've told you guys that. In America, guess what? You're rich compared to 98% of the rest of the world. We're all rich. It doesn't have to do with social class. It has to do with belief. They both believed in this place called hell, but, but one walked their faith out. The other one lived in his own ways. So what's the four lessons that we can learn from the rich man? Here they are. Number one, the rich man was fully conscious the whole time. The rich man was fully aware that he had loved ones that he wanted to be saved. He was fully aware that he was thirsty. He was fully aware that in his torment, he knew everything that was going on. He was fully aware in hell. Second thing is that his eternal destiny was fixed. There were no second chances. There were no another, give me another shot. I'll do better. There was no, there, the Bible says there was no place of in-between. There's not an in-between. Contrary to some belief systems out there, there is not an in-between. You cannot do something for someone who has already made a decision to follow or not follow Jesus. You know why? Because they made their decision and their decision relies between them and God and God alone. This is the part that really rubs people wrong. You know why? We want second and third and fourth chances. You know what? You're given sec, second, third, thousand, million chances here and now. Don't wait to the last breath. It's here and now. So it was fixed. Number three, he knew that what he was experiencing was just. He had earned it. He didn't ask to be taken out of that place. No, he does something different. We're going to learn what number four does. What does he do? He pleaded for someone to help his loved ones. Here's what scripture says. It says, verse 27, he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers, and let, let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Remember I said to you, I believe Satan does two lies. One, he tries to convince the world there's no such thing as hell. Because if there's no such thing as hell, there's no consequence for the sin that they do. There's no consequence for decisions they make. They can do whatever they want to do, live like they want to live. There's no such thing as hell. But I said something else. I said, or he tries to convince believers that hell isn't as bad as what you think. I think this. Hell isn't as bad as what I think. It's worse. Because my mind can't even fathom the torment of hell. Here's the good news. After all that, I got good news? Yeah, I got some good news. You ready? You don't have to fear hell. Not a single one in here has to fear this place called hell. How do I know? How, how do you know, Pastor Kevin, that, that I don't have to worry about hell? You don't know what I did in my life. You don't know the decisions I've made. You don't know the places I've been, the things I've said, the, 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 the attitude I've had. You don't know me. No, I don't know you. I, I, I don't know you from anything. I know me. And here's what I know. For God so loved me that he gave his son to die upon the cross for me, that if I believe and if I receive and if I surrender my life to him, I will not perish, but I will have everlasting eternal life. Because my salvation has nothing to do with me, 
thank you, Jesus. My salvation has everything to do with what Jesus did upon that cross. Mm. So therefore, I don't have to fear hell because I know where Jesus is in my life. He is my hope. He is my security. He is my everlasting Savior. So I can stand confidently in knowing who Christ is in my life. So I know this for you. If you accept, if you surrender, if you believe, you will receive eternal life. Well, wait a minute. I'm not, I, I don't do things right. I don't, I don't live perfectly. I say things about, yes, 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 yes. Now, we don't go on sinning so that grace may abound by any means, but however, God's love overcomes a multitude of sins, right? So why does, why does Satan want to convince someone, I don't, I don't fear hell. I'm not fearful of hell. I know where I'm at. If I were to die right now, I know where I would spend eternity because I know who saves me. Okay. However, Satan does sometimes get into our heads as believers and convince us, just wait one more day to tell someone else about me, about Jesus. Just, just wait one more day to tell somebody about who I am. Just Satan's like, don't tell them. Tell them they got one more day to surrender their life to Christ. Got one more second, one more day. We're not promised one more day. We're promised right here, right now. There's a story of a man named Charles Peace. He was a criminal in the 1800s in England, and Charles was, uh, was a murderer. I mean, he took a life, and because he did take a life, he was condemned to death. So on his final moments of his dying days, on his final moments where he was taking his, he going to take his last breath of, priest was called in to talk with him and the priest came in and said Charles are you ready to meet your maker Charles had no clue what he's talking about he said I don't know what you mean by that he said well you're ready to meet God and he said who's God he says well are you ready to meet God in the next life because you're going to be judged for all the things you've done wrong and Charles when you're judged you're going to you're going to be sent to one of two places. You're going to be sent to a place called heaven if you've done good, or you're going to be sent to a place called hell if you haven't done so good. And Charles said, I'm in prison. I haven't done good. So hell is my destiny. What is hell like? And the priest said, oh, Charles, hell is horrible. Hell is hurtful and painful, and, 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 and there'll be suffering every day, and hell is a place where... where you're going to be separated from the presence of God and you won't know what love is and you're going to be everlasting in torment. Hell's a horrible place. You don't want to go there, Charles. And, and Charles looks at the priest and he says, Father, do you, do you really believe that? Do you really believe hell is that bad of a place? And the priest thought and he said, I think so. He said, no, no, Father, tell him. Do you really believe that? If hell is so bad, do you really believe that me and my loved ones are going to spend eternity there? Do you believe that? And the priest thought and said, yeah, I, I'm, I think I do. He said, you can't believe it. Father, you can't believe it. Because if you believed it, you would stop at nothing to tell your loved ones who Jesus is and how he can save them from a place like that. You would crawl across glass from coast to coast in England just to save one if you really believed it. As a believer, that convicts me. If I really believed hell was such a place, I would reach everyone I could. I would tell every person that I come across with. I would live in such a way that they would see Jesus in me and they would want to know who he is. Satan will try to convince us it's not that bad of a place, so therefore we don't have to do anything about it. Hell is a real place, and all of us will face eternity in one of the two. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, what a tough message to preach, God. What a challenging message to preach. God, how I pray that the word has come out and the word has been spoken in truth and reality. 
God, for those of us who are Christ followers, for those of us who have surrendered our life to Christ, we don't fear hell. No, we don't need to fear hell. For you overcame death, hell, and the grave through the power of the cross and the resurrection. So we stand confidently, not in our own strength, but in who you are, Jesus, and what you did upon the cross. We stand confidently in that. However, God, if we're being honest, many of us as Christ followers, we've fallen for the lie to believe that hell isn't that bad of a place. So we're not motivated to tell our coworkers, our friends, our family, our loved ones about who he is and how his love can change us. Because after all, it's not that bad of a place. Challenge us, convict us. With your head bowed and eyes closed, who is it in your life who doesn't know Jesus Christ? Who is it in your life who hasn't surrendered completely to Jesus Christ? A loved one, a family member, a co-worker, maybe a fellow student in school, whoever it is, can you just right now picture them in your head? And can you just, let's just take their name before the throne of God and, and let's just pray for them right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a prayer. You just go with me and I'm gonna have you call their name out in just a minute. Father God, we come before you. We bring to you this person right now. Just call their name out between you and God. God, we ask you, challenge us, challenge us to be faced with the reality of what hell is really like, and may we do everything we can to see this individual come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We commit them in your hands right now, touch their lives. As you continue to pray this morning, there's those in this house today that you don't know this Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to fear hell. All you need to do is trust the love of God. For God so loved that he gave, he gave, he gave, he gave his life for you so that you can have eternal life. And today, you can be saved. Today, you can be changed. Today, you can be transformed. Here, now, no waiting. No put off to another day. Don't wait another day. Don't believe the lie there's another day. Don't believe just wait. Don't believe that here, now, God is here for you. Surrender your life. What does that look like? That means admitting that you're a sinner in need of a savior and that you believe that he died upon the cross and you believe in his love and you accept his free gift of salvation. You're here this morning. And you know that God loves you and you trust the love of God and you want to surrender your life back to him because of that love. Right here, right now, head bowed, eyes closed. You're here and you say, I need Jesus. Save me. I trust him now. Would you just raise your hands right now all across this place? Raise them up that you're trusting Jesus for your salvation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your response. Your hand raised right here, right now. You're going to talk to the creator. He wants to hear from you. Just say these words between you and him. Say, God, forgive me. I have sinned. I surrender my life to you. All that I am. I believe, say this, I believe that Jesus is the only way. So I give my life to him now. Come into my heart. Make me new change me. I believe in you every day of my life. Thank you for your love. Father, as we come out of this message today, I ask that God, as the week goes on, that we would never fear hell itself, but we would always trust in the love of God that changes us day after day after day. Guide and direct our steps and help us, God, walk with you daily. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for giving us a chance upon chance upon chance to walk with you every day. We love you. We thank you so very much. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.